So my question today is, what are the odds? The odds of winning the Powerball lottery? One in 292.2 million. Save your money, people. The odds of dying in a plane crash? One in 816,545,929. The odds of being a victim of identity theft, one in three. The odds of creating the perfect March Madness bracket, one in 9.2 quintillion. Interestingly, the same as the odds of the Razorbacks making it to that bracket. Amen. (laughs) Sorry. The odds of being struck and killed by a falling coconut? One in 250 million. The odds of being both left-handed and a natural redhead? One in two million. The odds of seeing a pigeon do a backflip? One in 500,000. So go, statistically, If you make your way through looking at 499,000 pigeons, you're close. (laughs) The odds of your sneeze coinciding with a power outage, one in two million. The odds of getting perfect score on a test by choosing answers at random, one in 170 trillion. It's bad news for students. The odds of discovering your blind date is actually a distant cousin. One in 200. Yeah, chance is even greater in Arkansas. Right? The odds of Pastor Rod eating a pickle. One in never going to happen. And the odds of being ungrateful, according to the story we look at today, nine out of 10. Most people don't consider themselves ungrateful. They just forget. But the difference between being grateful and ungrateful is a lot more than just two letters. It's the difference between pleasing and grieving God. It's the difference between rejoicing and complaining, being content or being restless, appreciating blessings, or taking them for granted. In Luke chapter 17, we find the story of an incredible miracle with a powerful lesson to be learned from a guy whose name is never mentioned. Luke chapter 17, beginning with verse 11. On his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, 10 men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance because they had to. According to the law, lepers were unclean and had to be removed from society. They were outcasts. They were only allowed to be around other lepers. They had to stay 100 paces or about 300 feet from anyone else. In this case, there were nine Jews and a Samaritan together. That ordinarily didn't happen. Jews hated Samaritans. But as lepers, they were all equal, outcasts, lonely, and alone. There's a powerful principle there. Shared suffering stops prejudice. When you realize you have the same problem, it doesn't matter if the other person is black, white, Hispanic, or Asian. You're just fellow strugglers. These guys didn't see themselves as Jews or Samaritans. They were lepers. Leprosy couldn't be hidden. It was a horrible, gross, ugly, disfiguring disease that ate away at your flesh. In advanced stages, fingers and toes literally fall off the body. I've been to a home for lepers in India. Those pictures are mild compared to what I saw. Somehow, these guys found out that Jesus is on the way. When the 10 lepers saw Jesus... They knew it was their moment of opportunity. They had heard about his healing power. They stood at a distance 
and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, go show yourself to the priests. That doesn't sound like pity or compassion. Go show yourself to the priests. But the lepers instantly knew what it meant. The priests were the only one who could declare a leper had been cleansed and then allow them to re-enter society. The lepers didn't expect to be sent on a walk. They wanted an instant healing. But Jesus said, go show yourself to the priest. So they took off walking, and as they went, they were cleansed. They took action and obedience on behalf of the lepers to receive their miracle. The Bible doesn't say they were cleansed, and then they went off to the priest. They were cleansed as they were going. The lepers had to trust, obey, and take action before receiving their miracle. This is one of those stories where the Bible leaves out the emotion and the detail, so we have to use our imagination. As the lepers put one foot in front of another down that dusty road, they begin to feel something strange, a feeling they'd never felt before. They look down and a piece of new skin, like baby skin, popped up on their arms. Fingers and toes popped out as they walked. I don't know exactly how it happened, but as they begin towards Jerusalem, the healing power of God cleansed their leprosy. The lepers were filled with excitement as they watched the leprosy disappear. They were dancing, leaping, and shouting. Instead of a weary walk down that road, they were running and jumping and skipping. They were out of control with excitement. They were fresh, new, clean, whole. Joy overflowed in their hearts. They would no longer be outcasts. They could rejoin their families. They could return to society and life. The 10 lepers believed what Jesus said and obeyed what he commanded. And be, when he, they began walking towards the priests, God healed them of their leprosy. I want to just pause my message for a moment because I just, while I'm talking, since the Lord directed me to pray for someone who's sick. So would you just close your eyes with me? And I want to be obedient to the Lord. And if you have a sickness or disease for which there seems to be no answer, I just really felt the Lord prompt me to stop right here and pray for you. If you're here and that's you, would you just raise your hand? I won't pray for you. If you're watching online, click the button. Would you do one more thing? If you raise your hand, would you stand up? I won't pray for you. No tricks, I promise. And if somebody's standing near you or next to you, would you just reach out and put your hand on their shoulder? And we're going we're gonna to pray together right now. It's not in the script, not in the plan. I just believe the Lord directed me to do this, and so I want to be obedient. Because the same God who healed those lepers as they walked down the road can touch and heal you right now. There, there was no answer. and There was no cure. But he holds all things in his hands. And so I want to pray for you right now in Jesus' name. God, I thank you that you are the same. You don't change. The same power that was evidenced as those 10 lepers walked down the road is available to us right now here today. And so I pray for that same miraculous touch in Jesus' name. For people in this room and people watching online who, who there seems to be no answer and there seems to be no way out. I pray right now that the power of God would flow through their body with life and health and healing and wholeness and restoration in Jesus' name. I pray that everything the enemy has tried to destroy, everything that disease has threatened would be renewed by the power of God. Lord, we put our faith and our hope and our trust in you as our healer. And we believe right now for a supernatural touch in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for allowing me to pray with you. God, they healed them of their leprosy. But the story didn't end there. One of them 
when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. All 10 lepers were healed. Only one of them returned to thank Jesus for his healing. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. God's will becomes complete when you begin to give thanks for what he has done. Many Christians put emphasis on belief and obedience, but very little on gratitude. God commands you to be thankful. For which you say, well, I, I don't have much to be thankful for. There's, there's just a whole lot going wrong in my life. Cindy and I faced a lot in 2023, by far the most difficult year of our lives. But through it all, we made the intentional decision to remain grateful, to focus on the goodness of God. In our most difficult year, we gave more than we gave any other year. We refused to allow circumstances to affect our gratitude. The Lord is faithful, and we are grateful. This leper took extra steps to return and thank Jesus. His attitude of gratitude separated him from the rest of the group. Really, can you blame the other nine? They'd been separated from society and family for years. They'd endured persecution, ridicule, and scorn. This is their moment. Nothing would stop them from getting to the priest and being pronounced clean. But the nine must have known that one guy turned around to go back. Still, that didn't slow them down. So the one healed leper went back on his own. Thankfulness always requires extra steps and extra time. It's easier not to say thank you. It's easier not to write a thank you note. It's easier not to take the extra step to express gratitude. Sadly, it's easy to take God's blessings and the people and leaders God has put in your life for granted. The leper threw himself at Jesus' feet, thanking him. Jesus answered, We're not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Jesus knew all 10 lepers were healed. He didn't ask the question because he was curious. He asked the question to illustrate a principle and underline an attitude. When Jesus healed the 10 lepers, two groups were immediately formed. The grateful group had a membership of one. The ungrateful group had nine members who disappeared, never to be heard from again. When you receive from God, or that matter from people, you are either grateful or ungrateful. What's the difference? Ungrateful people see the bad in every good situation. Ungrateful people are negative. They spot the bad and they bring it to the attention of others. They might even call their negative critical spirit a gift. In a stack of a hundred things, an ungrateful person detects the bad thing in a matter of seconds. Negativity is one of the primary marks of being ungrateful. A family sat down to eat. The father asked his son to pray, and he said, it won't do any good. Dad said, why not? He said, because we're having broccoli. <laughs> Some people only see the broccoli and never see the rest of the meal. On the other hand, Grateful people see the good in every bad situation. They know the broccoli is healthy even if they don't like the taste. They see food they didn't have to pay for. Ungrateful people complain about how bad they have it compared to others. You'd be surprised how often I hear, I just don't understand why God doesn't bless me like he blesses those other people. They get a check in the mail. I don't understand why I have to struggle so much when other people are blessed. Why does everyone else find someone and I'm still alone? I got a plan. How about comparing down rather than up? How about looking at the homeless person living on the streets, the family who's lost it all, they're the children living on the streets in Calcutta? Why not compare with people who have less blessings than you? 
Grateful people, on the other hand, understand how good they have compared it to others. Come on, God's blessed you. We are blessed to live in America. We have it better than anyone else in the world. Be grateful. Realize how good you have it. Ungrateful people think they deserve more than they get. They're like spoiled kids at Christmas. They open mounds of gifts, hundreds of dollars worth of incredible things, play with them five minutes, and then want to go buy the stuff they didn't get. Instead of concentrating on the great things they got, they focus on the things they wanted and didn't get. As a parent or a gift giver, your thought is, and some of you say it out loud, how dare that ungrateful, self-centered, spoiled little brat be so rude and ungrateful after I sacrifice to give to them? I wonder if God sometimes feels the same way. Ungrateful people think they deserve more. Rather than thanking God for what they have, they complain that they don't have enough. I should have more money. I should have a nicer house. I should have newer clothes. I should be as wealthy as anyone else. After all, look what I've done for God. Grateful people realize they don't deserve what they have. God, the creator of the universe, sent his son Jesus to die on a cross for your sins. You didn't deserve it. He did it anyway. God, who blesses me with material blessings, only ask I return 10% to him. I get to keep 90%. I don't deserve that much, but God gives it to me. I don't deserve anything, but thank God he blesses me anyway. Ungrateful people think they qualify for more because of their goodness. They're self-centered. They believe they deserve more attention, more money, more stuff, more blessings because of how good they are. Grateful people know that everything they have is because of God's goodness. They give God credit for everything. Everything I have comes from God and belongs to God. When the lone leper returned, he glorified God with a loud voice. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. No one had to wonder if he was really being thankful or just being courteous. His loud voice answered any questions about his sincerity. Have you ever wondered why someone worships big and loud? They dance, they shout, they sing really loud. Maybe it's because they're thankful God saved them, healed them, set them free and gave them a purpose. The more thankful you are for what he's done, the more excited you are to thank him. Jesus didn't heal the lepers and then remind him to thank him. Jesus didn't do what your mom does. Now, now Rod, what do you say to the nice man? True thankfulness arises from within your soul. It never has to be forced by outside forces. God doesn't make you be grateful. Grateful people never have to be reminded to give thanks. The Samaritan leper looked at the new flesh on his fingers and toes, which grew back in front of his eyes. And his first reaction was to run back to Jesus as fast as he could. He fell on his face at Jesus' feet and he cried out, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus did the same incredible miracle for all 10 lepers. Their entire lives were changed because of their healing. They were made whole. They could go home. They could return to society. They could see their families. Never again would people walk away from them when they approached. They had a new lease on life. But Jesus is grieved that nine out of 10 didn't even say thank you. Although God never forces you to thank him, he still wants and expects to be thanked. God is grieved and disappointed when he blesses you and you neglect to thank him or you take credit for his blessings. Then he, Jesus, said to the ungrateful leper, rise and go, your faith has made you well. If this was a movie, here's what would happen next. The nine lepers who didn't return to give thanks were all most to the door of the temple, ready to show their healed body to the priest when suddenly their fingers and toes fell off and the leprosy reappeared. 
The grateful guy was forever healed. The rest were forever doomed to be lepers. But that's not what happened. Although Jesus expressed disappointment that the other lepers didn't return to thank him, God is so good that he is still kind of the ungrateful. Luke 6.35 says, love your enemies. Do good to them and lend them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High because he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. God is kind even to the ungrateful, but God reserves his blessings for the grateful. I teach our staff this principle. Gifts are attracted to gratitude. Gifts are attracted to gratitude. You enjoy giving to people who express their gratitude. It's just more fun to give to someone who says, thank you. Have you ever gone to a kid's birthday party and they're excited about gifts? They're laughing and high-fiving and then they open your gift and they look at it and say, I already got this. You still give the gift because it's the right thing to do, but their lack of gratitude takes the joy out of giving. It's more fun to give to grateful people. Some people are takers. They don't say thank you because they think they deserve it. They may get a gift once, but they don't get it again. If I'm going to give to someone, I'm going to give to the person who's grateful. God enjoys giving gifts to his children, but he enjoys it even more when we're thankful. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Being grateful is the will of God. If you want to know how can I be right in the center of God's will, Start thanking him for what he's given you. Here's what I've learned. I call it the receiving progression. First is blessing. The first time you're, you receive, you're excited. You get a $100 Christmas bonus at work. It's your first Christmas there. You are fired up. You open up that check. You're so thrilled. You're running, saying thank you. Or you're writing thank you notes to your bosses. You're pumped. It's a blessing. After that comes expectation. After three years in a row, you now expect a $100 Christmas bonus. It's no longer seen as a blessing. This is something you get every year. You still th say thanks, but it's not that big a deal. Moves from blessing to expectation and then to entitlement. After some time, you forget the bonus is ever optional. If you don't receive the bonus, you feel ripped off. You don't bother, bother saying thank you because you should get more than a measly $100. The more you think you're entitled to, the less you will be grateful for. The bigger the sense of entitlement, the smaller the sense of gratitude. God commands you to be grateful, to never see his blessings as an entitlement. When you take for granted or believe you deserve his gifts, you're no longer thankful. Recently, I was disappointed with someone who received a blessing as an entitlement. There was no gratitude, there was no word of thanks, nothing. Giving was the right thing to do, but the joy was no longer there. Their lack of gratitude took the joy out of my giving. I wonder, when I view my blessings as an entitlement, does it take the joy out of giving for God? In the old days, we used to have testimony service. Anybody remember testimony service? Oh, you got all kinds of stories. I could tell stories for hours. It was testimony service was your chance to take the microphone. And what you were supposed to do was share a testimony. Share what you were thankful for, what God had done for you. Uh, we don't do open mic night anymore because too many people took it as an opportunity to vent or complain or to share their weird, weird theology instead of just praising and thanking God. But even though we don't have testimony service, the principle is still powerful. Be grateful. Give thanks to God for everything he's done. Like, I'm, uh, like you, I'm afraid sometimes I take God's blessings for granted. 
especially when things are going wrong. So every once in a while, I use my whole prayer time to thank God. I just walk and thank him. Don't ask him for a thing. I just thank him. I thank him for a warm home. I thank him for a wife who loves me and tolerates me. I thank him that I get to work with my sons. I thank him for food on the table. I thank him for a truck to drive. I thank him for the team I serve with. I thank him for a healthy church that's flexible and open to change. For a church that's outward focused instead of selfish. I thank him for older church members who put aside their preferences to see younger generations connect to God. I just spend my time doing nothing but saying thank you. Gratitude reminds you how blessed you are and how big and wonderful God is. Saying thank you helps you focus on the blessings instead of the challenges. I don't ever want to be the focus of Jesus' questions. I don't ever want him to say, where's Rob? Where's the other nine? Where are the other people I've healed? Where are the others who've been blessed? Why didn't, why didn't they come say thank you? Never forget this verse. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. When you're grateful and say thank you, you follow God's will for your life. Now, don't put your outline away because I've got some action steps for you. All right, we're going to put this into action this week. Number one, this week, change your routine for one day in your time with God. If you don't currently have time with God, add it for one day. Spend the whole time, whether it's five minutes or an hour, thanking him for everything he's done for you. Express your thanks to God. Well, what am I going to thank him for? How would I go five whole minutes thanking him? Just start. And when you get going, you'll realize how much you have to be thankful for. Spend the whole time just thanking him. And when you run out of things to thank him for, you're done. Number two, express your thanks to others. This week, write three thank you notes or texts or emails to someone you appreciate or someone who's done something for you. Be openly grateful without any expectation of something in return. Practice gratitude. And then number three, here's the hard one. Examine your attitude. Are there areas or things or people that you've begun to treat as an entitlement instead of a blessing? Ask God to forgive you for the ugly attitude of entitlement and help you follow his will by being grateful. All right? To help you put it into action, we're going to do that together right now. So bow your heads with me. And we're going to spend the next, oh, I mean, I'm really going to stretch you. We're going to spend the next 90 seconds just saying, saying thank you to him. I want you to do it out loud. I, I'm going to do it in my normal tone of voice. You can whisper, you can shout, whatever you want. But for 90 seconds, all we're going to do is thank him. Okay, we're gonna, you're going to try it. All right, are you ready? The next 90 seconds, let's thank him together. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for this church family. Lord, I am so grateful. I'm so grateful to, for the people that you've put in my life. I thank you for the people that I've known for more than 30 years. Who, who knew me and Cindy when we were young and who invested in Tyler's life and invested in Parker's life and continue to love us today. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for Sue who surprises us with brownies. We enjoy that so much. It always brings a smile to our face. Thank you for her. Bless her today, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for Cindy. Thank you that uh, for 37 years together and just everything that you've blessed us with. Thank you for our home. Thank you for my truck. I love driving my truck. Thank you for that, Lord. Thank you for beautiful trees. 
in our yard. We enjoy those trees so much. Jesus, thank you for my health that I'm able to, to walk and, and move and live and breathe. Thank you, Jesus, for that. Thank you for my grandchildren. Thank you for Maverick and Evie. Thank you for the joy that they bring to my life. Thank you, Jesus, that I get to live near them and do life with them and hang out with them and spend time with them. I enjoy it so much. Lord, thank you for Mary Grace and for bringing her to this church and bringing her into our lives. She brings a lot of joy to me and Cindy. Thank you for, for bringing her to North Little Rock in, in the most unusual of ways. Thank you for it, Lord, for Lucas and Megan. Thank you that they were able to spend this season of their life here with us. It's just such a joy to us. Thank you, Jesus, for that. Lord, thank you for the hundreds and hundreds of people who serve you through the ministries of this church every week. Thank you for all that they do for others and all that they do for lost people and all that they do for us. Thank you, Jesus, that I get to be a part of a healthy church. That I, that I get to be here and my family gets to be here and we get to grow and, and serve you together. Thank you, Jesus, for your financial blessings. Thank you that I was able to put gas in my truck this week. Thank you, Lord, that we have food on the table. Thank you, Lord, for air conditioning, especially as the summer comes. I'm so grateful, Lord, to be able to turn on the air and be nice and cool. Thank you for that. Lord, thank you for all the blessings that you give us. Thank you for the blessing of living in America where we can openly and audibly worship you and thank you and pray and praise. Thank you, Jesus, for your blessings. Thank you for all that you've done for me and all that you do for us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I surprised you. That was three minutes. How'd you do? There's just something about being thankful that takes your eyes off your problems and puts your eyes on your Savior.